Hi, welcome back. All right, this will be the fourth of the kind of basics evaluation, introduction evaluation. This will be the fourth piece. And what I want to do is talk about the challenges of modeling growth. We'll end there. And then that will set up the rest of the lecture series. Obviously, the lecture series is called The Value of Growth. So we've gone through or technically eight episodes to get to the point where we can start to talk about growth. And we'll talk, we'll, we'll start that process really in the next video. All right, as we've set this, the, the, the basics, the four basic uh, videos on valuation, I, I boiled it down and said the, the value of an asset is essentially the cash flow the asset will generate over its useful life. Um, and there are really four components, timing of cash flow, the duration of those cash flow, the magnitude of those cash flow, and the growth of those cash flows. And in stocks, we generally think of annual cash flows, so we can kind of uh, assume that one away. So it's the cash flows, it's really duration, magnitude, and growth. And we've been setting that up. The duration is forever. Magnitude, you need to estimate. And the challenge is growth, as I'll show in a minute. And then we discount future cash flows back for time value money and uncertainty of receiving those cash flows. And our primary tool is a DCF. That's what this equation is. The equation on the right is the present value, the sum of all future cash flows discounted back for time and uncertainty. And we capture that down below. FCF is your free cash flow. We're going to use NOPAT, as we talked about in the prior video, your discount rate and then duration. We're going to use forever, at least you need to use forever, all the cash flows. All right. Now, the, the practical approach of using a DCF is to split the cash flows into two different streams, if you will. The first is what we call the explicit forecast period. We're going to model these maybe very extensively, get to know the company well, reinvestment rate, profitability, and things like that. And then you would use a terminal value. Terminal value is meant to capture all of the cash flows beyond year five. And that's how this equation works out. And this is how valuation is taught in virtually every business school, probably in the world, certainly in the U.S. Um, and it works sort of. It just doesn't it works in theory for sure. It doesn't really work in practice. And the problem, of course, is the terminal value ends up being more than 70% of the present value. And I, I could make this statement 100 times until it sinks in, but the explicit forecast, which may be a very detailed model, is only capturing 20, 25% of the total value of the asset. In this case, it's the stock, the company. And the rest, called 70, 75, maybe even 80% of the value is stuffed into the terminal value. And the terminal value, as we talked about last week, is incredibly sensitive to the assumptions you make. So for, I think, virtually everybody on Wall Street, this is the limitation that prevents them from wanting to use a DCF, at least seriously use a DCF in any kind of stock valuation. And it's too bad because the DCF is theoretically correct and potentially a very powerful tool, but in practice, it doesn't really work. And the primary reason it doesn't work is we're stuffing way too much value in the terminal value and we're using very simple formulas or trying to use very simple formulas to calculate the terminal value. So we're, as I said, we ended last video at saying we're sort of at an impasse, works beautifully in theory and is basically dysfunctional in practice. All right, and this really is the result. I have a lot of confidence maybe in my explicit forecast period, very detailed model, but then I'm mixing it with this other terminal value that has very low quality. And if I mix those two together, unfortunately, the terminal value is going to dominate the result and since our confidence in the terminal value is so low, then the effective overall is very low. So the question then is, how do we get around this? All right, here's the real issue. The challenge in a DCF took me a long time. I will admit it took me a long time to figure this out. Once I figured it out, it was sort of obvious. <laughs> it was a long journey to get to obvious. All right, growth. Growth is the fundamental problem uh, and the challenge of using a DCF. And once we acknowledge that, all of a sudden the tool becomes 
significantly more powerful as I want to show you. At least we're going to start today. All right, so here's your DCF challenge. These are those free cash flows well into the future. I, I did a 10-year forecast here just to make it easy graphically. Uh, you know, please, if you add too many years, it gets a little bit uh, uh, jumbled up. All right, so we have 10 years worth of cash flow and we want to value those. Well, we would do a DCF. We'd have an estimate of all 10 years and then we discount that back, all the cash flows back. All right, that I like, that's pretty cool. Um, except we still have the problem years 11 through forever. That's going to be a problem. All right. So let's just split the cash flows into two streams. One, we will call a steady state, no growth uh, set of cash flows. That is blue. And then any growth up above and beyond that steady state, no growth cash flows will be growth. Right. So green is growth and blue is that steady state no growth value. Now, I'm going to use blue and green for the rest of my lectures. From now until the very end of my lectures, I will use blue for steady state and I will use green for growth. So you'll sometimes hear me talk about let's value the blue, then let's value the green. All right. So once we've done this, uh, the valuation challenge becomes trivial. All right. Modeling this is easy. Uh, we know how to model a, a steady state no growth uh, set of cash flows. Now, I do have to make a side comment here because all I am showing is 10 years. But in reality, we have to forecast those cash flows forever. So it's the steady state, no growth cash flows, but forever. Now, I normally get a couple of pushbacks from my students. Number one is people will say, I can't forecast forever. So I'm uncomfortable with this method because that first layer, that blue layer, the no growth, steady state, no growth uh, cash flows, you're making me forecast that forever and I'm not comfortable beyond your five or 10. True, all true, I like that. Except that when you use a multiple, you're effectively forecasting forever and there is a slice of those cash flows that equals blue. Or if you happen to use a DCF with a five year or a 10 year explicit, and then a terminal value after that, you are effectively doing this. That initial uh, value is for five years, but what's embedded in the terminal value is an infinite stream of steady state. So any way you look at it, you're already doing this. If you use a multiple, you're doing this. If you use uh, DCF, you're doing this. So all, all valuation methods assume that there's a certain level of cash flows that last forever. Now, part of it is that when you start discounting after year 25 or 30, those incremental value is not very much. That's part of the trick, but we're ahead of the story. All right, so modeling this is trivial, but we are making the assumption that there is this steady state cash flow that lasts forever. Another pushback I get from my students is, well, what should I use as that level? Now, you have a couple of options. One is you could do some work and come up with what you think is a good estimate of what the company can earn over um, five or 10 years, that kind of the, the highest number that you feel confident that they can earn year in and year out. Or you could just think of it as an average level of cash flows over a 10 year period. You're just coming up with an estimate that you're comfortable with. All right, so modeling this is trivial, as I'll show you in a minute. Modeling growth is hard. So let's separate the easy problem from the hard problem. I think that's the best way to think about it. All right, let's do the blue part first. Let's assume no growth. Well, if there's no growth to the cash flow, then no pat one equals no pat two, which equals no pat three, which equals all the no pats all the way out to infinity. That's what we get if we assume steady state, no growth. Pretty cool. Well, valuing this is as I've said a couple of times, fairly trivial. We can use the perpetuity valuation formula because if no pad is the same and it lasts forever, this is a perpetuity and the valuation is easy. We just take our estimate of no pad, that steady state, no growth estimate and divide it by your discount rate. Now, many of you will realize this is just a multiple. This is, uh, if your discount rate is 10, you're multiplying that no pad by 10. If your discount rate is eight, you're multiplying that no pad by 12 and a half. 
If you have a higher discount rate, you know, say 15% discount rate, you're multiplying your notepad by essentially seven and a half. So it is a multiple. But the nice part is it's easy to value. You can just think of it. Um, and we're going to use this tool extensively through the rest of my videos. And I'll give you some examples. Once we through valuation, I will do an example or two on a real company. My early, my early lecture, by the way, on Apple, I use these tools. You can go back now as you're starting to see the tools, listen to the Apple video again, and um, uh, you'll get some insight to where those tools come from. So now we're building back up to that. Apple will be one of our cases. Uh, interesting, on the Apple video, at the end, I said that this, uh, using these tools, blue and green, uh, 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 the steady state and, and green was growth, I said that the stock no longer represented the kind of investment that Buffett made. And at the time I made that video, he had already started to sell the position. And he more recently announced he had sold half of it. Very consistent with the analysis in that video. Kind of fun to put something out and have it come true. That does not happen very often in the stock market. All right. So assuming no growth, then we have the value of the stock is this perpetuity valuation for me. Very straightforward. This is our base camp. You'll hear me say that a lot of time. What would you value the company if they earned a certain amount of money forever? That's that steady state, no growth value. And then we have to go figure out growth, which is obviously where we're trying to head. All right. Now, this is the definition of earnings power value. Now, I have seen lots of definitions of earnings power value in my many years in this, and this is the one I like. So earnings power value, EPV, I'll often refer to it as EPV, is that steady state, no growth value. That's that no pat capitalized by the discount rate. So that's a... Uh, 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 to me, this is, I think, kind of a cool insight. So earnings power value is the steady state, no growth cash flow. And then we take that to create a value, the value of it. So the steady state, no pat, is often referred to as earnings power. Now, Ben Graham was the first one to coin the phrase. Buffett talks about owner's earnings, same thing. Um, you could create the value of owner's earnings would effectively be earnings power value. All right. Now, research techniques are important. I'm not trying to get away from that. And there is certain value to a DCF because certainly the explicit forecast period has a lot of value because you're forced to understand the business. And so when you go and you say, hey, um, uh, I'm modeling this. What are the profitability? What are the profitability trends? What is um, the balance sheet look like? Right? What's return on capital look like? Um, this is where you would do earnings quality and any kind of, kind of forensic analysis. I think there's a lot of value here. So I, the, the explicit forecast period, I think, does have a fair amount of value. It's that terminal value that I have a problem with. Um, and this will, will, will lead us to uh, competitive analysis, which is where we're a detour we're going to take in the next vi video. All right. So here's just a graphic. There's your no pat there. That's equivalent to earnings power. Flip earnings power to the other side. So there's your magnitude of cash flow. There's your duration of cash flow, which in this case is forever. And we've eliminated growth. We've taken growth out of it. So if you take your earnings power and you multiply it by the duration, you're going to have a visual representation of your earnings power value. Now, key here is that I've, I've showed time. This will go infinitely on the right. Now, I know people are still, some might be struggling with that assumption. We'll get you over that in a bit. You just have to, to live with it for the moment. Uh, if you don't mind, I, mean, I will come back to it, I promise. All right, so that's my earnings power value visualization. I like that because we're going to use these tools. When you go look at the Apple video, you'll see that I've started to morph the tool to use it in the real world, which is kind of cool. All right, so modeling growth is hard. That's going to be the challenge. And as I said earlier, the value of growth is the name of this lecture series. So I wanted to get to the point where we understood what are we really trying to model. Let's pull growth out of the steady state. We can value the steady state, get an earnings power value. And then from there, we can go figure out how to value growth. Um, we'll have to, a couple more pieces before we get there, but this is clearly where we're headed. All right, the practical approaches that we're taught that are taught are um, you know, formulas you can use for your terminal value, per, uh, perpetuity, uh, perpetual growth, which is the same growth forever, um, 
not a great assumption, but it's a model, the Gordon growth model, which really looks at uh, growth against the cost of capital and then a no growth perpetuity, which is very similar to what we did just now with the um, steady state, no growth, steady state value. All right. They all have growth in their name. Obviously, growth is the issue. What I want to introduce, and we're going to start in the next couple of videos, is a different set of tools to analyze the value of growth. That is the name of the lecture series. That's where we're headed. It's taken us eight lectures to start there. When the next video, we're going to talk a little bit about competitive advantage. That's a critical piece. Once we get through there, we'll start to layer in the concept of valuing growth. All right. So we're going to solve this problem with the terminal value is greater than 70%. I have some tools, some hacks that get around it. Use the power of a DCF without the severe limitations. All right. We'll solve the growth problem in this lecture series. I promise. All right. Thanks for listening.